like to start by thanking everybody for coming this afternoon, this evening, and also many of you for coming yesterday as well. We are representatives from the Urban Land Institute, and we've spent the past day and a half, and even longer than that. You can hear me back here. Yes. I guess the speakers are on on that side, too. Uh, let me take care of that stuff for you. Well, I'm going to continue speaking. Can you hear me anyway? Yes. 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 Nod in the back if you can hear me. Okay, good. So, so we are representatives from the Urban Land Institute. Um, we have spent the past day and a half, and even prior to that, studying, um, researching, walking, driving through um, the site that we're going to talk to you today, um, which was recently acquired through a boundary adjustment with Fairfax County, as you know. And so we are very, very excited to talk to you about some of our findings and our recommendations. Um, we've titled this Development Opportunities in the City of Falls Church. And just a little bit about the Urban Land Institute, which is one of the organizations that's sponsoring this program. The mission of the Urban Land Institute, or ULI, is to provide leadership in the responsible use of land and in creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. We're a global organization with what we call district council offices all over the United States and all over Europe and Asia as well. Uh, my name is Deborah Kirsten Billick. I'm the Director of Community Outreach for the Washington, D.C. office. And uh, before you today are nine of some of our most esteemed uh, members. We're a membership organization. We're supported by our members, and we're really grateful to everybody um, in front of me today for your time and for your talent. <coughs> so as I mentioned, we have these chapter um, offices, or district councils as we call them. Here in, Was in the Washington region, we have over 2,000 members. That's considered quite large. Uh, we're one of the largest district councils in the United States, right up there with New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Uh, we emphasize... Uh, our emphasis is on sharing best practices and providing outreach to communities, and we do that through a variety of different programs, one of which is the Technical Assistance Panel, which is what we have done over the past day and a half. Um, we conduct a variety of TAPs all over the region. Many of them are listed before you. Uh, they range in their scope. They can be site-specific. They can be building-specific. They can be policy-oriented. But this one, and we're really grateful to the City of Falls Church for the opportunity, took a look at a very unique um, study area that, that has a lot of opportunity for redevelopment. And I think at this point I'll mention this particular program um, was brought to us in conjunction with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And we'll get a little bit into that, but uh, we actually accepted it on a competitive basis to take a look at the city, in part because the city is um, one of COG's activity centers um, that they've designated regionally, which is a place for priority growth over the next uh, 30 years, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But I guess the main point there is uh, we're excited about this. It was selected out of a, a list of different um, uh, proposals that came our way, and so really this has just been a great experience. So these are the panelists. As I said, we spent the past day and a half and even longer than that um, studying. This is a picture from earlier this morning, just as we were getting going with one of our site plans. We're a happier group than that. <laughs> this was taken maybe about 10 a.m. Um, but really, it's been, I will say, you know, we, we conduct these all throughout the year, and this group in particular has been especially cohesive, um, especially especially bright, but also especially astute in, in um, your ability to really pick up on some of the nuances. So thank you, thank you. And at this point, I think what would be great is if you could introduce yourselves. I'll start, we'll go this way and then over. Um, I'm Bob Wolf, I work for the Center for, I direct the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship at George Mason. Uh, I just started that post, before that I worked for 30 years in real estate development in this region for a variety of uh, local developers. And I'm Bob Eisenberg uh, with Heritage Property Company based in Bethesda. Anthony Chang with Washington REIT, I'm the office expert. And I uh, bank in the city of Falls Church. My uh, eye doctor is here, my <laughs> pediatrician, for my kids, and I'm a Maryfield resident, so I'm all in. They're done. So you can use some money. My name is Elizabeth Baker. I'm an urban planner. I work for a law firm in Arlington called Walsh Colucci. I do most of my work in Fairfax County, particularly along the Silver Line and Tysons. And about 25 years ago, I spent two years over in City Hall in the Economic Development Department. Okay. I'm uh, Len Bograd with RCL Co., Robert Charles Lesser & Company. We're a real estate consulting firm. I do a lot of fiscal impact analysis and market and financial analysis for a range of developments, including over the years uh, major mixed-use developments like Reston Town Center, downtown Silver Spring, National Harbor, and so on. I'm Peter Crowley, a partner with Land Design. We're a, a firm that does master planning, urban design, and landscape 
architecture projects locally and globally. Good afternoon. I'm Martine Combal. I work in the District of Columbia Deputy Mayor's Office for Planning and Economic Development, and I've been doing public sector real estate for the past nine years. I'm Gary Molaski. I'm a, uh, a consultant in public-private partnerships. My background is in real estate development and more recently in the Joint Development Program at Vermont. And I'm Sean O'Donnell. I lead the National and International School Design Practice in Perkins Eastman Architects. We're based out of Washington, D.C. So we're back to using the mic, and I'll ask the panelists to use the mic again. Um, you have in front of you a ton of talent. I mean, we, we as a joke, calculated the number of hours and the um, quantifiable amount of resources spent over the past day and a half, and it's, it's quite a bit. So we're really pleased to talk to you today. Um, one thing I'll just mention in terms of housekeeping is we'd like to save questions to the end of the um, presentation, so if you wouldn't mind just holding your questions. So um, as I mentioned, this, this project was brought to ULI through a partnership with the Metropolitan Washington Council of, Gro of Governments with the idea that we know the region is growing, right? And growth is a good thing, but it also poses lots of challenges. Um, congestion, for example. Congestion is a good thing, but it's also really a challenging thing because it's a signal of a really thriving uh, neighborhood and thriving community. So, uh, one of the objectives of this tap is to think about some of the regional trends and the regional themes that can be derived through the project and perhaps serve as an example for other jurisdictions throughout the region. And I thought I would just highlight three that were pretty obvious to us. The first is creating a place around what is becoming an underutilized metro station. We took a look at some set, um, statistics and we noticed that the West Falls Church metro station ridership numbers have decreased quite significantly since the Silver Line has opened. So that means something for the utilization of the station. Um, and so, I, you know, I used to work, many of you knew uh, the late Ron Kirby. He was a former mentor of mine, and I like to quote him whenever I can just to extend his legacy. But he used to say that um, transportation, is a land use, transportation is a land use strategy. And so if you think about this um, site, you know, it's at the nexus of uh, Route 7, 66, the West Falls Church Metro Station. There's really just a lot of opportunity here to capitalize on um, the nexus between transportation and land use. So that's one major theme that we're seeing throughout the region, especially when it comes to underutilized metro stations. <coughs> Excuse me. The second is um, addressing current and future metro travel patterns. So if you take a look at this map here, which is the most updated map of the system that includes the Silver Line extension, you can see, and everybody knows this, that when the system was built in the 60s, it was designed to be um, a hub and spoke system, right? Like people would come in from the suburbs in the mornings, go to work in the core of the region in the, during the day, and then come back in the afternoon. And what we're seeing now is that's really just obsolete. It's not the case anymore. That's not the way the region is growing, um, and that's not the way that we need our infrastructure to support that growth. We're seeing lots of um, commuting in between suburbs and also circumferential commuting patterns as well. So um, this is an opportunity to really think about the West Falls Church Metro Station within that greater network. It's not just a part of a spoke anymore, and I think that's something to be uh, considered. And the final thing, and this is with regard to the school and, and the development of the school, is the idea of civic uses in a mixed-use context. And this is a theme we're seeing throughout the region as well. Uh, ULI just did a tap recently focusing, thank you. I'm pregnant also, so I appreciate it. <laughs> it means more than you know. <laughs> so this one too. Um, so civic use is in a mixed in a mixed use context. We just did a tap in the um, Prince George's Plaza metro station out in Prince George's County, and that tap took a look specifically at co-locating a library and a community center um, within this bigger station area. We know that um, in DC there's a study looking at the different library sites, taking a look at what were formerly standalone libraries and integrating them into the context of communities around them. And so too here, you've asked us to take a look at a school and integrate it uh, within the bigger context of what might be a mixed use development. And so it's worth highlighting that this is not unique to Falls Church. Um, if Falls Church uh, implements what we hope will be a really robust plan, you might end up being a case study for the region in terms of a really great success story but we're seeing this all around the region as well. And so the point here is just to highlight that it's a site-specific um, study, but it's something that has trends throughout the region too. Yes, um, I'm gonna talk about the vision in just a second, but I wanna tell you what we're going to do and lay out the, uh, the next uh, 40 minutes or so. 
as I said, I'll talk about the vision. Uh, I'm then going to go right into site selection. Which part of those 30 acres did we think was best suited for a 10 acre commercial development? We'll then take that site and develop a concept plan for you, and we'll lay that out very, very geographically. Uh, we'll then go into the program to the uses, the development program that we think best fits on that site, given today's market and, and the next few years' market. Then we'll talk about implementing that development program. How do you attract a developer? How do you structure a public-private partnership? We'll then go into uh, the, uh, the uh, fiscal and development uh, uh, benefits from that, from that project, which would flow to the city. And finally, we'll talk about uh, the timeline, how long it's going to take for all this to happen. And it always takes longer, and it always costs more. Uh, the vision. We started by saying, what is Falls Church? Uh, well, we came away with two, two major impressions from having talked to a lot, to talk and listen. Uh, one is the little city, and it, you, you see yourselves as unique within the national capital urban landscape. Uh, and secondly, you are rightfully proud of your national ranked schools, and those schools attract lots of people who come here, and they are well educated and uh, often well off. Uh, and that is, those are good people to attract. So, next slide, yes. How do we embed 10 acres of commercial development in this $100 million high school campus? How, does they fit, how do they fit together? We think by creating an agora, which is based on the ancient Greek city-state, a place where the academy and commerce meet. The idea here is that these are not in conflict. The school and the 10 acres of commercial development are not in conflict. They should work together. In fact, they benefit each other synergistically, to use a word that's overused. And you'll see in our concept plan how we've married the two. Uh, and we think it will result in a creative marketplace of ideas and goods. So, as I said, what we've done is instead of trying to separate the two uses, we've linked them. And, and we've, we've, we've matched them up such that we think that the school and the community and the people who, who use the commercial site will all work together. We're, we're, we were very impressed when we talked to the school people about all of the activities that occur after school hours, in the evenings and on weekends, and how the community has accepted the school as, as a meeting place, as a marketplace, as a place to, to, to come and learn. And we think that's a tremendous advantage to the commercial development, and we want to take advantage of that. Uh, and we think, on the other hand, that by putting a, a very nice 10-acre town center next to the school, the school will benefit as well. So we see this as, as something that will benefit both. Now, site selection. There really are two sites that you can pick. One is the football field. If you look at the, uh, Sean, can you move one second? Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, there are really two sites. Uh, this football field, which is about 10 acres, and the land that is starting from my hand and going to Haycock Road is about 10 acres. Those are, given, what, given the priority of the school, which we took as the number one priority, those are really the only two sites that make any sense. We selected the Haycock Road site. Uh, we felt that it maximized, the, the, it would, you could build a vertical mixed-use project on that site, and that maximized the land value for the city. And there really wasn't a suitable alternative on the rest of the site. Uh, here's the problem with that. Here's the development sequence. You build the new school, you tear down the old school, and then you develop a 10-acre commercial site. What's the conclusion? The income from the 10-acre site does not support the construction of the school. I'm sure that's a disappointment to this group. Now, it's a temporary problem because the, the, the income from the 10-acre site, the fiscal income from taxes, and the development income from leasing or selling the site kick in later, but they kick in later. Let's look at the football field site. The reason we didn't choose it is because it is isolated. You cannot develop retail on that site. No retailer will go there. The only thing you can build there easily are multifamily units, both rental or for sale. And you can build them all day there. Three-minute three walk to, to the metro. 
But because you can't build retail, you can't build office easily. Now, here's the logic of that. The office market is, is almost at a watershed. It used to be everybody wanted to go to the suburbs and build a campus. And, and that's where people wanted to rent. That is changing. It's changing dramatically. Now, people want offices in cities. They want them in places where their employees <coughs> want to live and places where they can shop and go to the bar and the restaurant. That is not the football site. You cannot create that environment on the football site because it is so isolated. So if you want to create a vibrant, mixed-use community, you go to the Haycock Road site. And that allows us to build office, residential, retail, and entertainment. Uh, if I could just add, the other thing we talked about is it also allows Falls Church to maintain your identity <laughs> yes. as a town. And I'll even jump further uh, beyond that in that by putting it on Haycock, you, you create a, a, a situation where that whole region benefits from that project. So Frit may suddenly, well not suddenly, they'll slowly decide that they might want that 10 acres. And a, they would be a terrific partner, by the way. The, the buyers on the Gordon Triangle, when they see the 10 acre development that you guys are going to have, might decide to get serious about their land. So I think it's a rising tide that will raise all boats in a very important intersection, a western gateway to your city. So that only happens on the Haycock Road site. That doesn't happen on the football field side. And, and you know, it's not a bad land bank. In 50 years, when the educational limits run off of that land, who knows what it's worth? So wait 50 years. It'll, it'll be a great site. It'll be a great site. Um, I think is, this is me now. Is Pete, oh, you're, you're doing the accessibility. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I think you all know this site better than we do, but here's a picture just to remind you uh, about the location here with Route 7 and Haycock. And while there are some internal roads, there's really no connectivity at all to the metro. It's kind of shocking, really, how little connectivity there is between these uses. And so when uh, we started looking at this, the most important thing we thought to do initially was to establish a grid of streets, to establish a framework for the future development through that grid of streets. This is standard suburbanized development, and we need to move into more urban city-like development with blocks that are walkable, uh, very pedestrian friendly. And so that was the first task that we took on. And we, while we did look at... Um, no, I don't know what that slide was, though. So, well, we did look at this. Well, we did look at this um, particular um, acreage here. We couldn't not look at the rest of it. We couldn't not look at the UVA VT site and the Wamata site. They're just too important to look at individually. You have to look at them as a whole, and that's how you're going to get the most value for the future is by working together with your neighbors to create an overall scheme. Oh, next. This is your street grid? Oh, this is my street grid. Okay, it used to be yellow, but now it's kind of orangey yellow. Okay, so what we did here, again, this is Route 7, Broad Street, and then, of course, this is Haycock Road. The metro station is up here. And so what we did is to try to connect uh, these two disparate areas through a grid of streets by creating a street system that comes through the site. This is the future um, relocated school site right here, and then another one coming in parallel to it, all leading towards the metro station. And at the same time, off of Haycock, this is the existing road that comes in, which is not really a road, but it's like a driveway through the, the parking lot, which would become more of a local street, more of a um, complete street, shall we say, and then another street that would come through in, in this direction. So in this way, we're able to get a connection throughout the whole development. And we even kind of looked across the street uh, to the Frit development to see how in the future they could redevelop and then connect with that grid of streets so that there's a pattern that's established and sets the tone. Um, and this is really important. And what we think is when you have all these connections, you reduce the impact on any one intersection. You have a variety of ways to get in and out and through the site. And therefore, we're trying to relieve some of the pressure that we know exists right now at the Haycock intersection with uh, Broad Street. We are not traffic consultants. We don't pretend to be traffic consultants, so there's a lot of work to be done on that, but this is the concept that we came to kind of set the framework. 
And I would say that all of these streets are viewed to be what we like to call complete streets. You know, they would have on-street parking, they would have street trees and amenity panels, they would have clear pedestrian walkways that are wide enough to accommodate the, the residents, the students, the, the folks that come to visit. And they would have outdoor dining areas where they're appro appropriate. And then on some of these streets, they may also have on-street bike lanes, which is very important because all of that connectivity for pedestrians and bicycles are sorely missing and they really need to be included in this plan. So once we came up with this grid, then Peter did his magic to make it even more complete. So, here you go. Well, Sean and I had a great day together drawing as fast as we could. <laughs> and everyone helped color. <laughs> uh, so that was uh, not always between the lines. <laughs> as they say, that was special. <laughs> so, so the property, Broad Street, you all know, Haycock Road. This is the 10-acre parcel. This is the academic campus. Uh, the idea of these co-located educational facilities. Uh, you, you're going to be so inspired when you see what Sean has dreamed about for this site. And as the person who is more engaged in framing the urban fabric of the 10-acre site, I can talk about a few things that went into the, our, our discussions, our thought process. The, the plan literally continued to change up until uh, 20 minutes before this presentation. So thank you for <laughs> continuing to change the PowerPoint. Uh, first of all, Broad Street. Uh, you know, a great street creates an identity. And I know that you all have endeavored over many, many years to create a great address on Broad Street. It's, the, it's that corridor of commerce, and, and it really changes when you come to Haycock as you transition uh, out in across uh, I-66. So the first thing we said was we need to, we need to bring that DNA of Broad Street all the way across the frontage of the property. Uh, the second thing that we thought about was, uh, you know, planners, as you get them together, or designers, the first thing we do in a room is we, uh, we rearrange the furniture, and then the second thing we do is we draw outside the line. So we started to, just in a, you know, idea of diagrammatic form, think about, you know, the, the framework of what could happen here. Elizabeth talked about creating this grid that extends off the site. And we think that with great cooperation between the universities and Fairfax County and, and Metro, great things can happen here. We, we also understand that this particular property may be the catalyst for many of these activities to occur. And so what we imagined was uh, a broad street that uh, became the uh, continuation of DNA. It became the exclamation point as you move toward this, uh, this agora. We thought it was in incredibly important to create connectivity uh, be between uh, this, this academic use and, and, and this commercial use. Um, and this is a mixed environment. It includes residential of a number of types. It includes entertainment and dining shopping, uh, employment, hospitality. So we, we have truly created a framework uh, that, that accommodates all of those elements. Uh, that, that, new, uh, that new street that Elizabeth talked about off Broad Street, uh, we would hope to have an, uh, a signal here. We're not traffic engineers, but it certainly looked like we would want one. And it begins to create a great address for uh, for the school and a great address for this new mixed-use community and for these other future development activities. Uh, off Haycock uh, Road, uh, we brought in a new street and a second street off of Broad. And this street through here becomes our internal shopping street. It becomes the high street, the place where the restaurants would occur. You know, we, we, we've got ideas about um, health and fitness and you know, some sort of anchor that could be a movie theater or some other type use uh, that would anchor this street. And then a, an intimately scaled public place 
that's a part of that animation, and restaurants are always a big part of the mix. Beyond that, it's a series of uh, uh, it's a series of, of uses that incorporate probably above grade and below grade, but the above grade is shielded from the perimeter. Park, the parking. The parking. Thank you. I, thought, I assumed everybody knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Parking's on everybody's mind when you're talking about development. Um, and uh, we created a series of blocks. So if uh, if you go to, to the next slide, I think there's a little SketchUp model. And by the way, Garrison, who works with uh, county staff, was he's an amazing young millennial, and he created these graphics for us, uh, just real time. So um, if everybody could just give him a round. Of applause. So this is an idea plan. And uh, it's, it's meant to inspire, and it's meant to suggest, and it's meant to provoke thought. Uh, along this Route one, uh, 7, Broad Street uh, frontage, we need a great street. Uh, it should be activated. Those, those uh, commercial uses should occur along that street. And in fact, we, we think that this academic campus is a wonderful opportunity to uh, sort of introduce nature into this part uh, of, of the town in a unique way. You know, we're, we're, we're doing so much more with rainwater harvesting in terms of the, uh, thinking of water as a resource, and I'm certain that that will be a part of this overall development. Along our Haycock Road frontage, uh, we're bringing uh, uh, retail along that frontage, and then all along the high street, to this uh, large open space that's culminated uh, with, uh, with retail uses. We look for a location for a hotel, and I think that you all will go through the facts and figures on that later. We look for a couple of locations for employment uh, that, could, that could occur on the site. Uh, and, and we thought about this block and grid system and how it creates opportunities for the adjoining properties uh, as a part of the overall development. So the placemaking we think is supremely important, human scale walkable development, creating a unique place that is oriented toward commerce, and then creating a unique place that's oriented toward uh, the agora and toward the academic uses where all those pieces come together. Uh, so Sean, maybe you want to talk a little bit about academic uses. Thanks. So, in thinking about the school, which in many ways is driving why we're here tonight, right, um, there are tremendous opportunities, and I like to think of schools as communities, you know, those great learning communities, professional communities inside the boundaries of the school. But as we're talking, you can also look beyond the boundaries, and the school becomes in many ways the center of the larger community and embracing the, all the context you know, that Peter was just talking about and becoming that great idea of an agora, the, the center, the heart of Falls Church when we're done here, if we do this right. <laughs> so this is a, a plan of, of a building that's about 320,000 square feet. You know, we had to imagine the program in many ways uh, you know, because I mean, we're, we're maybe trying to envision what a 21st century learning environment it looks like for the high school now. But there's a few things to note. Um, one, we kept the existing high school in operation while we built the new building. So we thought that uh, operationally just worked out much better for phasing uh, the project you know, from all different vantage points. But we also kept the middle school as is. But the high school in many ways is trying to draw itself into a relationship you know, very strongly uh, with with the uh, middle school. So I'm gonna show you a few different uh, slides, but the other things to note here is we have reorganized the sort of upper ball fields here. Um, and we've also got sort of a crank in the campus here. Um, and the reason why we did that is north is actually this direction. And what we're trying to do as one of a sort of design principle for a high performance learning environment <coughs> is to really optimize natural light in them. Environment, but also think about sustainable design in a larger strategy as well. So this is actually the tallest part of the campus, and we've been talking about a vertical 
building to try and conserve land and, and make all this opportunity uh, possible. So this piece of the building is where perhaps most of the uh, labs, classrooms, other instructional spaces are, are located, um, and that's about four stories tall. Um, and we think we can do that in four stories. Uh, there's a logic, I think, in a number of different strategies to organize a high school into so, sort of groups of four. But again, you know, this is sort of hypothetical. And then around here, you see that there are a variety of the larger spaces. So there's uh, a gym, there's an auxiliary gym, there's a theater, there's a 25-yard uh, competition pool. Um, and all those things are orbiting around what I like to think of as the heart of the school. So this is, in many ways, that agora internal to both the middle school and the high school that will become that great place where the community comes together. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. But a few other things to note about the campus um, is that uh, the mulch pile is not here. Um, so we've used that to optimize the play fields up here. We thought uh, the, on the campus currently there's a lot of opportunity in this portion of the campus. Um, and the bus storage is not here as well. Um, so, that said, the other uh, thing that we've assumed as well is, is you won't see any parking, surface parking here, again, uh, with this idea of optimizing the land for education and other uses. We, we're thinking maybe you know, some structured parking underneath the uh, stadium down here uh, at the bottom of the sloop. So, we might uh, build a deck and put the stadium up on top of that as well. So, this is the street frontage. The front door is right here. I think on the next slide we might have a more urban view. Um, well, this is a zoom in of the SketchUp model that you just saw before. Here's the uh, middle school in the sort of white boxes here. Um, and then the colored array is, is the new high school. So, again, thinking about some of the larger <coughs> spaces, a theater, gyms, a pool, orbiting around this sort of glassy, you know, transparent part as the heart of the school with the academic wing over here, allowing us in many ways to turn this uh, four-story building off and use the rest of the facility as, as a community center, you know, around the clock. We've heard so much about all the community use of these various spaces. So in essence, you're building a community center and a school at the same time. You're getting the most value for the, the investment in the project. Sean, the, uh, the, the, the taller building closer to Broad Street also creates a landmark as you're coming into town, doesn't it? That's right. So as, as you come on Broadwood Street, uh, or uh, actually leave on Broad Street as well, the taller mass of the building will uh, you know, be very much a landmark as you approach. And again, it's organized so that natural light south is that way, so we can control uh, solar access and really create a, a beautiful daylight facility. Um, which is true, again, on the north side of the building, overlooking all the fields and all those opportunities, again, to have great visual connectivity out to the, the external learning environment in many ways, um, really seamlessly knitting the campus back together. And I'll show you a few images in a moment about how that works. But just to give you some idea of, of what this might look like, because these are very diagrammatic, um, so to put some meat on the bones perhaps, starting to think about what 21st century learning environments are. One, it starts at the front door. There's a great place in front of the building that people can congregate and gather, or take yearbook photos. This is Dunbar High School, just opened in Washington, D.C., a vertical campus, much like we're talking about. But again, this idea of that agora, that great place in front of the building next. And when you enter a building, um, it should be inviting, right? Um, but establishing the identity of the school that great place for parents and teachers to come together, identity, but also safety and security, of course, at the front door, making sure that it's welcoming but secure. And then when you come into the building thinking, again, this idea of a heart of a school, what is that? It's a great place um, that is public in many ways. It's an indoor plaza in Agora. So here you see a food court in Dunbar High School, um, which is in this sort of atrium-like environment. And it's, everything is orbiting around that, including, or next, please. Sorry. Ideas of, you know, Food is a great social environment. So you can create a great learning environment as well in there. You see the children, they're not eating in some of these environments. You go ahead, that was good. Um, so this is the learning environment, but they're, they're hanging out, they're studying, they're doing a lot of different things. You're, you're making this great place in, you know, just like we were talking in the urban environment, it continues into the fabric of the building. 
and all the special spaces, the community spaces such as the theater and the gyms. And again, thinking about natural light, we have all that north-facing exposure on the gyms and we can have all this glare-free natural light coming in, into the pool and other environments, even the stage. Um, and the idea of you know, where's the library going in a 21st century learning environment? I put it right in that heart of the school, so it is that sort of intellectual hub right in the middle. Um, and it's, it's inside and outside, public and private, quiet and noisy, next. And other ideas about how social spaces are being created in, in the learning commons or the library of the 21st century, next. And this great heart of the school, here you see Dunbar's, um, during the day, during uh, you know, its major crossroads for all the students during the day. But at night, it can become, next, a place where Howard University, for example, just held their homecoming gala in that very same space, using the stair as a stage and theatrical lighting. And it really becomes this beautiful place for the community to gather, so uh, serving both the school and the community. And thinking about verticality, um, in many ways, you get a more intimate uh, learning environment by going vertical. The campus isn't that spread out. You don't have to walk that far. And this is four stories. This is Dunbar High School again. And you get this sort of beautiful landmark in many ways, as Peter was indicating, you know, by that verticality. But thinking about the interior of that building, classroom environments, flexible, maybe project-based, and different opportunities to vary what's going on. So fused with technology, of course, next and thinking about different opportunities for different learning environments, design studios and maker spaces, food and wellness and culture coming together perhaps. Um, and then finally, again, thinking about that idea of vertical and also civic, you know, we're trying to create great civic architecture. So here's that four-story building, the, the gym that you saw, that glass coming through. Or this is another building with a pool that's got sort of a shapely roof. Again, establishing you know, this sort of civic presence of the building that your new high school deserves so much. So, I want to go to school there. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that too. <laughs> so my job is to share with you many of the trade-offs on all of the different elements we considered for this project. And in any commercial project with this level of complexity, you could do anything. But what happens when you do something, you can't do something else? So we looked at, we, we listened deeply to you yesterday, we synthesized it with our experience, and we heard loud and clear there's a huge concern about residential units driving up school uh, age children, which obviously is part of the problem we're trying to solve. So we, we considered a lot of creative ideas on how we could try to minimize that while meeting the market because we all know there's a deep market for residential product, so what are the elements that we can do? We also heard great ideas on the retail front and said, what is going to drive the retail so the entire project is going to be successful? And we know that you need an anchor, you need something to pull people in, and the idea of having a movie theater and a health club stacked on top of one another, and you see where, where uh, taking 40,000 gross square feet there as the benchmark to, to embed everything. And then after that, restaurant is obviously the number one income driver from tax receipts in, in Falls Church City based on the analysis we've been provided. But you can't do all restaurants, right? It has to be moderated within, within set guidelines. So another 40,000 feet of restaurants. And then other retail is a catch-all. We heard from many of you afterward, after our formal sessions yesterday, that Falls Church City prides itself on the unique nature of its retail. And having been here, I, I love it. It has integrity. All the, all the places here are not something that you could find somewhere else. And it makes this place special. And that would go in other retail. So we're, we're just saying, okay, what are the big blocks of, of what we're working with? And as an office expert myself, I can tell you that today, you cannot have successful office without a vibrant environment. Many of you know Fairview Park. Fairview Park was developed in a time when uh, everyone wanted that campus that Bob was talking about. Birds and bunnies were what they were chasing. <laughs> Fairview Park is one of the... How do I put this delicately? <laughs> Most challenged office parks in Northern Virginia today. 
because birds and bunnies is not what the market demands. In an age of innovation, in an age of Google, if you look at uh, in the 50s and 60s, MetLife insurance companies were putting their names on high rises. Today, Salesforce, they dropped the dot com and they are naming buildings in San Francisco and London and across the world. So this new era of innovative office user, they want beer and burgers. So if you get the retail right, you will get the office. You already have a proven medical office community here. And by the time this project is, is going to deliver, you're going to have the opportunity to offer class A, triple A products for medical office. Medical office commands higher rents, it justifies the structured parking, and it will leverage the strategic position of Falls Church City in between Inova and Virginia Hospital Center, in addition to the population base that's already around Falls Church City. Traditional office, in today's sense, where are you going to get the innovative users who say, this is where I want to go? Custom Inc. decided to go to Mosaic. You can't even see them from Lee Highway or Gallows Road, but they chose to be embedded inside a project because of the mixed-use environment that Mosaic provides. And by the way, Custom Inc. is paying 20% more in rent than any other project in Marysfield to give you a sense of what's possible when you create this diverse mixed-use environment. Housing. This is the most troubling piece based on what you told us. So he said, how can we minimize school-aged children in the housing product that we offer? We heard from Virginia Tech. They have classrooms in Maryfield and Loring. They have classrooms here, and they have classrooms in Boston. Guess what? We could provide them the graduate housing, right? So not the frat parties, but the super nerds <laughs> that don't cause any trouble but pay the rent on time and provide them housing along with faculty. Active adult apartments. You already have Sunrise Assisted Living in your community. There's a market for people who aren't necessarily at that assisted living but they want to live somewhere that's very dynamic. So these would be the, whether it's rental product or condos, that, again, they're already re practically retired, almost retired, still very active, still a lot to give. And when you think of that intersection of the active adults that we're talking about and the possibilities with the school, it's exciting. The number one underutilized resource today are probably our, our boomers who are retired. This is an opportunity to connect what's happening in the commercial with the schools, whether it's the graduate schools as adjuncts or in the high schools as volunteers. And lastly, condoms. If you look here in this table, just to orient you, we've kind of grouped it by type, right? Retail, office, uh, residential, and hotel. Here's units because all of the economics in our model as we build things up are based on units. So it's 500 units of this kind of grad housing, traditional housing. There will be some school-aged children, but we've tried to minimize it. 140 active adult apartments, 80 condos. You see there's fewer condos because it's just how the condo market works relative to market rate rentals. And then what that means in terms of the average per square foot size of each of those units. And then what the gross buildable square feet is on the right. So we built everything from the ground up, challenging each other. We heard from some of you that you want 3D printing places. You want innovative places to manufacture. And we said, all right, does that work? And we said, it doesn't because that needs cheap real estate. When you have structured parking, and Peter did the calculations based on this, and said every single one of these uses requires a different parking ratio, and again, we're not the final experts, and we only had a couple hours to do this, but this is our napkin sketch. And, and this level of thinking went into our napkin sketch, and it gives you a sense of what could be possible in this ecosystem. Lastly, a hotel, a 110-key hotel, the rooms are about 650 feet each. And we said, okay, how's that all come together? And that means we're building about 1.1 million square feet. 
and that's kind of the, again, this is just a napkin, it's very fungible, we don't have any definite ideas, we couldn't, sure as heck couldn't tell you the name of the store is going in. So that, that's kind of the, the framework on what we thought the development program would look like. And that's the trade-offs, right? You, everything you do, you're going to take from something else. So the market will ultimately tell you what's possible. Here is a snapshot of the plan. You can see the movies and fitness center are anchored. The school is over here. The metro is up here. And how are we going to phase it? Phase one would be this super block. You would have to have the movies, the fitness center, as the anchor to pull everyone in. No one's going to come until they know that someone has already invested to make this happen. Then you have ground floor retail, and we've already gone through the plan. So when we go through the financials and the, the forecasting, it's based on kind of this phasing model. So super block is phase one. Next. Phase two, maybe a little hard to see with the color, but it's basically leveraging Broad Street and Haycock because this is your most valuable corner. That would be phase two. And when these sites are not being used after the school's been demolished, when phase one is built, this can be surface parking to give you a sense of what that would feel like as it builds out over time. Phase three, the inner uh, kind of quadrant, but you're very close to Metro. So what is the market going to tell you in terms of where the office is going to go, where the residential is going to go? We don't know, so the market will, will dictate a lot of what happens, but it's a great master plan to provide the flexibility to do that. This is how it's going to get done. Right. Right. <laughs> Well, we all agree that the development community really doesn't like risk and uncertainty. So in order to maximize the quality and the number of responses you get if you're looking for uh, responses to an RFP, to the extent you can do it, you want to reduce risk and uncertainty. And one of the first things in order to create the grid that we talked about is to meet with the universities and provide the new streets, the right-of-ways, and provide the connectivity to, uh, to Metro. So the way that you do that, we feel, is to get everyone together in a room at the same time. <clears throat> get all these stakeholders together and work cooperatively in terms of coming up with a plan for the entire area from Route 7 to the Metro Station. Now each of those organizations will have its own approval process and things like that. So the first step is really getting the staff together getting uh, agreement on a plan, and then in terms of approvals, we say here about the Fairfax Board of Supervisors, WMATA has its board, and other approvals. We put that on there because the time involved could actually be longer for these various approvals than for actually getting agreement on, on a plan. We don't know that. I mean, obviously, you have to do it to find out. But you just need to be aware there are uh, very well-defined and sometimes lengthy approval processes. All right, <laughs> switch places here. Um, just in terms of the planning process, it's important to note that you, you want to get a great sort of foundation for your planning, first and foremost. And that's why we strongly believe, as Gary just described, in a joint planning process, we think that you will actually unlock really the most value in the site if you can do a joint planning process with WMATA, with UVA, Virginia Tech, and Fairfax County. Um, this, as Gary described, is a process. Um, it will be about a year, year and a half, um, and it's important to involve the community in all of this. Um, it's, it's critical that the community buys into the plan, that they support the plan, because um, as you're looking to attract a developer, you know, there's risk if the community is not supportive of that plan, and that's something that the city can deal with up front. Um, if a joint plan cannot be completed, we, we thought it was critical that we acknowledge this point. Um, because if if you can't get your partners together, which we know that's a lot a lot of different governmental entities that have to be coordinated, um, just from a procurement standpoint, who's gonna pay for the plan, where's the money coming from, that, that takes time to put together. Um, so we felt that the city could in fact move forward with a plan 
of its own for the site, but you need to acknowledge that that does not unlock as much value, that it would reduce the value of the 10 acre site. Um, so, you know, you can move forward, but it, it's just not going to unlock as much value. Um, we, we heard from, um, I think, the staff and the city uh, yesterday, seems like this morning, I'm not exactly sure, um, <laughs> but what, just sort of a budget, you know, what type of consultants would be needed to engage um, in a planning process like this. And we estimated, and you know, the, this is sort of a ballpark estimate, but about two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollars. And the types of consultants, you know, we're all professionals here, and we can kind of make up that scheme. But you really need to go out and find a planning architecture firm that would engage traffic consultants, civil engineers. We thought it was important on the environmental side, again, sort of identifying potential risks for a developer to do an environmental um, site assessment so the developer kind of knows in demolishing the high school, you know, what, what materials went into the construction of that building, what um, may have been disposed of on site and so forth so that they can account for those costs in redeveloping it, as well as a market analysis. Um, Anthony talked about sort of his projection. We, we all kind of participated in the development, Len and Bob, and just thoughts about what might be viable on the site. But again, it's important to go out and do a, a market analysis. And then we thought it was important to, to identify possibly an appraiser, or you might want an economic development consultant to assist you to come up with an actual land valuation so that when you go through your disposition process to, um, through a lease or a sale, that you might want to have some information up front as to what that value of the land is before you're um, reviewing proposals. So when you go out for uh, an RFP and you get responses, there are a number of different ways that this can be structured. Uh, the simplest is, is a sale. The development community loves that uh, because they own the property, they have the future increase in value. Uh, there are no, no ongoing payments to the city. You do get payments at the time of closing, which can help defray the cost of the school. Land leases. This is one slide. You probably could do 40 slides on, <laughs> on land leases. Uh, but just to say the traditional land lease, where there are annual payments and then there's a revaluation, let's say, every 10 years, is really unpopular with the development community, and probably for good reason. If, if they have leases, the leases may not expire at the time of revaluations and so on and they're put in a position of not knowing what the returns are going to be and uh, even perhaps losing the property if there's a big revaluation but they're locked into old leases but fortunately I mean if you want to do land leases there are other ways to do it um, one of many is to have some kind of fixed annual payments and then negotiate some kind of participation in cash flow uh, that will be a long negotiation in terms of what that's based on, are there preferences, things like that. But that's part of what you have to go through if you're doing this. But it does provide, if you want to do a land lease, it does provide for fixed annual payments and you do get some participation and we think that as this gets completed, the values will, will go up and so there's opportunity for the city to participate in that. So that may be an option that, that you want to do. And lastly is a joint venture. Uh, they're very complex. Sometimes they're minimal annual payments. Um, you may, you know, very successful, it may be the way to maximize return. It's clearly the highest risk way to go, but uh, it's another option. And when you're looking for responses to an RFP, you don't have to necessarily pick one. In other words, you could say to the development community, uh, what kind of structure would you have if we're selling the property? What kind of price? And alternatively, if we want to do land leases, what would you offer us there? And to the extent you can give them some guidance as to things that are important to you, obviously that's, that's helpful. But uh, Wilmata, for example, has done this where offers come in from the same developer, sale, lease, and you can compare them and pick one. So that's another opportunity. So back, back to the process about how to structure a public-private partnership. 
Um, we, we discussed this and we, we don't want to sort of prescribe exactly what you should do. We incorporated some general best practices. Where I'm from in the District of Columbia, we put out something called the Request for Expressions of Interest. And we're recommending, um, you know, you can call it an RFI, an RFQ. There are so many different iterations, but we thought it was important um, for you all to combine sort of what it would be a request for information and a request for qualifications up front so that you are able to assess the quality of the teams, their financial and organizational capacity, as well as some initial ideas to sort of test the market um, so that you can then further inform and update and refine your RFP. And so it's really a two-stage process. Um, we, we think that you will get the most benefit from doing that. It's also a lower barrier of entry for developers um, to respond to an R, a full-blown RFP. As we like to refer it, it can be very, very costly. Um, and you may not get sort of the caliber of developers that you want up front. So we thought it was important that you do bifurcate that process. Um, overall, we think this is about a six-month process. Um, and you may want to hire an outside consultant to assist you um, not only in drafting the actual document, but possibly being an independent reviewer so that you can have someone else independently stand by the, the findings. In terms of issuing a request for proposals, um, we made an assumption here that you would be looking for what we're calling a master developer or a joint venture of a series of development teams. And the idea is that that development team, that single entity, the master developer, would be doing a couple of things. They would actually be demolishing part of the old school. Um, they would be constructing, constructing the roads, putting in the utilities. But you would also have them identify what we call component developers who would be doing those vertical buildings so that you know up front um, who those partners are. And there are many different firms that do this across the region that um, can piece together their hotel partners, their residential partners office, and so forth. Um, in the RFP, we've just got a couple of lessons learned that we thought were important to share. Um, if you're going to go out with this request for expressions of interest or request for information that um, you allow respondents to sort of alter their proposals. They, they're not limited to what they had put out up front. Um, it's critically important that you list your priorities and your requirements and that you're very clear about your requirements. And as we've said earlier, Gary identified, um, if you are not clear and you are um, sort of changing your mind about what you think, that's riskier for the developer because they're, they're not certain how the city would react, oh, they might change their position. So you really need to be firm about what you're asking for up front. Um, where possible, don't be vague. Um, I know that's, that can be kind of hard um, if you have an expectation that um, there's going to be, or somehow you're going to fit the mulching facility on site, um, but you're not exactly sure. To the extent that you can at least identify um, some parameters that the city is going through, that a decision would be made by a certain point, so that, again, there's certainty in the process. It's important to identify what you maybe not be able to make a decision on today, but you should have a decision at some point in the future. Um, and in all of this, you need to give the developer a flexibility to generate new ideas. Um, they are out in the market. They are doing this every day and it's important that they have the ability to alter their proposal. Um, and then finally, we talked about this earlier about engaging a consultant so that you would have a land valuation known up front before you get the responses so the city can adequately uh, address those and review them. Finally, the, these are um, fairly obvious, I think, but we it's important to lock in that developer um, in a relationship, so whether it's an, a memorandum of understanding or an exclusive rights agreement, um, you want to tie them down with the deal terms. Um, and the developer will also be going through an entitlement process. We recognize that there's a, an amendment to the comprehensive plan that's likely that needs to happen for this portion of the site that may or may not impact zoning. So the developer still needs to go through that process. And if that does, that process does change or somehow impacts the deal terms, that you need to update those. 
And with that topic of zoning, we would pass it back to Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. Just very briefly, you all know that when the property came into the city, it was zoned R1A, and obviously a uh, rezoning is needed even for the high school at the heights that we're proposing. We will be about 65 feet, I think, and so we'll need to move to another zone. Um, I understand that staff has suggested that B2 could work in that situation and could work for the commercial site as well. And with that uh, series of special exceptions, I suppose that's true, but it doesn't really seem like it's the best fit. It seems like this is a truly mixed-use project and you need a state-of-the-art, up-to-date, mixed-use zoning district, which I do not think you have in the city. And I think it would behoove you to um, put one together as you're doing the planning process, the, the um, small area plan or the POA as you talk about it, to actually come up with a zoning ordinance text amendment to pr produce a new district. And it might also help you in other areas of of redevelopment throughout the city as well. So that's our recommendation to you. Lynn. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so we know that fiscal impact is an important issue for you, both in terms of preserving your tax rate or ideally dropping it, and particularly in this project because this is a source potentially, and we think in fact, for uh, paying for some of the school. and, and uh, Bob will talk about, Bob Eisenberg will talk about how this feeds into that in a minute, but I first wanted to let you know what we come up with on the fiscal impact of the plan that we've been talking about here. Um, and I, I must say, we, we do this in a lot of different jurisdictions and almost never have the quite, you know, really, I think, high quality uh, fiscal impact model already in place that we can use, and we really appreciate economic development staff who've helped us tremendously in, in working through the analysis using using basically your model. The, the one issue that we have with it that's most significant, there are a few other things where we think it may be a little on the conservative side, but, but the one significant issue we had was the controversial issue I know of how many school children you're going to get per apartment unit. Um, and we know that you're, at least those of you who are involved in seeing these analyses, you're receiving two different uh, sort of bracketing uh, sets of assumptions right now, you know, based on two different sets of assumptions. Uh, So-called uh, high student uh, yield rate, which assumes a 0.33 children per rental apartment, and a low one, which effectively ends up at about 0.25 uh, students per apartment, assuming 70% one bedroom, 30% two, two bed, or studio, and 30% two bedroom, which is somewhat low, smaller units than the market is looking for, but we think is marketable, and we understand your interest in trying to keep the number of students low. So I think we've assumed that in all of our uh, modeling. Uh, we, those 1,000 square foot units are gross square footage, so they're more like about 850 rentable square feet. So um, we think, you know, and I do a lot of these st studies, both for public agencies and for private developers around the region, um, and we and we've also looked at the numbers uh, on the relatively small number of examples you have within the city. And um, where we think is very comfortable with an assumption of 0.12 students per apartment, given the mix of predominantly one bedroom units that you're likely to have. And, uh, and I think what we have to recognize is these are going to be expensive apartments. They are not, you know, most uh, families with kids in the United States who can afford various options don't opt to be in rental apartments or for that matter condominiums. They're, they're going into, and they're coming to the town, to the city, and, and we realize in large numbers, because mostly though in your existing single family houses or in teardowns and bigger houses, it's a fabulous attraction for those families to, to move here. But we, dis, despite that attraction, we don't see very many of them coming to rental apartments. Um, how did we come up with a point one two? We, looked, as I said, at some recent examples of developments here. We've also looked at other places we're doing work right now in, in Montgomery County and somewhat akin areas there. Um, there and looked at all of what, what has been attract, you know, what, how many kids have ended up in rental apartments, rental apartment developments, and it's averaging about 0.08. We recognize this, Fair Falls Church has this particular attraction, so we've increased that by 50% to get 1.12. But in any case, we've run the analysis with all three of these, so you can see what the implications are. Um, the total net revenues just during the 10-year development period and without inflation run from 25 million to 35 million, depending on what school assumptions you make and assuming the market and development issues we talked about. 
when you build out uh, on an annual basis, uh, we're expecting about four to five million dollars in annual uh, net impact after after taking account of added expenses, particularly for schools, in 2014 dollars once uh, it, it builds out. And you're familiar with the various tax sources that go into this, and we also assumed you'd want to know roughly how many students we're talking about. Uh, based on these, the assumption that we think is realistic, you'd have about 60 students, the high end uh, 165, and the city's sort of low yield rate assumption about 125. Uh, I'll turn it over to Bob to talk about how this feeds into paying for the school and so on. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Martin and, and Liz spoke a bit about the fairly extensive pre-development schedule that a project like this would entail. Um, this just sort of lays it out graphically, and the long and the short of it is, it amounts to close to five years before the 10-acre site would be in a position where the city could have some sense of what the development yield would be and what the resulting value of that property would be and how that could help to defray the cost of the school, um, which is really what it, what it all comes down to. Um, as was pointed out before, you could proceed and accelerate the schedule. You could start doing construction on the school before the five-year time, before you had nailed down exactly what the value might be for the 10-acre uh, parcel. But there's a, an ele element of risk with that, and you all can assess whether that's a tolerable, tolerable, tolerable risk or not. Even just saying it just upsets me. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm a risk averse guy. I don't know. <laughs> So, um, in any event, this is, uh, this is the timeline, it's, it's extensive, but at the end of this, you would have some sense of what the development yield is, what the land would be worth, you would have a master developer in tow committed to take down the land over time as, as market allows, and our suggestion would be that that would be after the high school is built. So if you flip, please. Um, so the school construction then would begin in approximately 2020, last two years. Uh, as was pointed out, and this is significant, the debt uh, to build the school would be incurred, would be, would be issued, uh, the bonds would be issued, and some debt service would start to accrue you know, immediately, even before there were new sources of revenue from either selling the land, ground leasing the land, uh, eventually the net tax revenue that the new development will, uh, will yield for the property. So um, there needs to be planning for that accordingly. Um, as far as it what we would call a takedown schedule for when the developable land would be put into play, would be turned over to a developer, either sold or ground lease. Um, and the, the, this space was something like 50%, give or take, of the site would be for that super block, I guess, as it was referred to. And that's important because it establishes the critical mass that's very important for both multifamily, for the retail venues. Um, it, it is important for sort of place making, for creating a sense of place. Um, and then beyond that, three years later, we assumed the next block would, would be taken down, and four years after that, uh, we assumed the, the, the last of those four blocks. Um, so in all, we assumed roughly a 10-year build-out for the commercial component of the site. And one thing that we, you know, all in this room understand is that real estate, real estate cycles happen, um, and so something will happen that will impact the schedule, either positively or negatively, but, you know, we can count on it. Um, so, yeah, count on it, not knowing. You know, that's the only thing that's, that's, the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. So, um, in any event, what do we get out of this whole process? You know, most importantly, it's a $100 million high school that I think, you know, could be uh, literally a landmark for the city, uh, something that everyone could feel, one, feel proud about, and two, that would really create a, a new place that you know doesn't exist today. As great as the city is, it, it's, it doesn't have that. I think it would be, you know, huge. Um, to pay for the school, we've assumed 100 million dollars in municipal bond, municipal bonds would be issued. Uh, we assumed a 4% interest rate, a little bit higher than what we understand today's rate would be, and a 30-year amortization for an asset like this. We think that's appropriate. Um, at the stabilization of the development on the property the roughly 1.1 million square feet of development, we project will cover approximately 60 to 80 percent of the debt service that would be required on these bonds. This is something, obviously, you have to look at. This was very broad brush. This is back of the napkin. Uh, there will be constraints here that we just are not in a position to evaluate um, or assess the importance of for the, for the city. 
but this this is our sort of uh, our, our mock up. Okay. Yeah. That's one more. That's okay. Is where you are? You just one more. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Uh, there we go. Oh. No, 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 not there. The other one is right there. Let's try it again. Hold on. You did this one. We did. That looks familiar too. And then the this next one. Right. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Let's hold it right there. Okay. Okay then. So, um, so we have uh, where we are today. We have starting a school construction that's quite expensive, and we don't have sources of revenue yet. Then we have a ten-year period where a ten-year period where we have um, some revenue starting to come in. Some of our costs have been incurred. Debt service is ongoing because we have our school that's been constructed and paid for with the bonds, um, and so. When you mash all that together, and this is where I hope not to lose you, because the numbers get, you know, they get exciting. Um, uh, in any event, we've got some land parcel sales or ground lease yeah. payments. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a different fiscal impact to the city based on which option is chosen. Um, but sale or ground lease, there's ongoing debt service on the bonds that have been issued. There will, as development is completed or as, as land is transferred into development use, it's then becomes taxable and, and the value is created, of course, through the development and then the lease up or occupancy process to stabilization. Um, there's going to be some new, te new tax revenues that will start to flow uh, to the city. Um, we looked at that 10 year period um, because once things are stabilized, we have a pretty good sense where things will, will end up. But over that 10 year period, probably 15 to 20 million dollars of capital will be needed above and beyond the 100 million dollar school construction, construction cost to cover. Um, things like debt service uh, before the new tax revenue is generated and above and beyond what we think the value for the land might be. Um, if that were to be, if those, uh, if the land disposition were, was to be by a ground lease, um, just qualitatively, not quantitatively, you'd expect the, in the, sh the near term 10 year shortfall would be probably greater because you're not getting some slugs of cash coming in. Uh, and then the ongoing uh, shortfall in meeting the debt service on the bonds would probably go down a little bit because you'd have ongoing ground rent. That's the trade-off. Uh, so the good news is that uh, from what we understood yesterday, there is cash that is available to use towards the construction of the school, towards this effort, and it sounds like that ca cash would be uh, adequate to cover this need over the construction period. So at the end of the day, Oh, that's no, that's good. Yeah. The last one, the picture. We want the pretty picture. <laughs> so this is this this is really what it's all about. You know, it's all about the kids. It's all about the school. It's all about creating a place that will be special, not just to the students, um, but to the community as well, and for a really long time. Um, so, uh, do you have closing remarks and thank yous and so forth that you were planning on doing? No. Well, let me, let me just, if I may, let me, let me just take a, a brief moment. I happen to be, first of all, it's been an honor to, to work with this team um, for this project. It's been, it's been great. I thank you for inviting us in to, to do this. Um, I happen to have also the privilege of being uh, one of the co-chairs of the Technical Assistance Panel Committee for ULI Washington. And uh, so a special thank you on behalf of the committee. Uh, for again for this opportunity it's uh, it's been interesting and exciting and uh, we're most appreciative of the opportunity thank you to all the city staff who's been great in helping organize so much information and provide great facilities for us um, uh, thank you to uh, I guess uh, uh, Cog for their uh, help in, in helping make this happen and really a whole cast of characters that I'm sure I'm leaving many too many out uh, but there we go so thank you very much took our hour and a half, so no mm -hmm. questions. <laughs> uh, I think we'll stick around. Uh, I don't know if any of the, we, we did, uh, if you have commitments and you have to leave, obviously go, but if not, we will stick around for questions. Um, hey Bob, before you take questions, yes. if anybody has to leave early, can you ask them to leave their name tag downstairs on the table? Leave your name tag downstairs on the table when you leave. Mayor?
Yes, I don't know if you're going to take uh, formal questions up here or you're going to do it in small groups. Uh, here. We're, we're going, going to, to take them up here. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, yeah. I didn't know whether it was going to break up or not. I just want to on behalf of the city to thank all of you. Uh, you've done a fantastic job. It's really exciting to see what you all have done in such a short time, you know, 36 hours, to see what you presented. It's just fantastic. And so we're most appreciative of that. Um, clearly, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. We'll, lots to think about. Um, but we really do thank you so much. If we could all give them a round of applause. Uh, okay, we've got time for questions, so just raise your hand. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I, I'm the Baltimore News Press. Um, I'm kind of surprised that the biggest asset of this whole new parcel of land is the metro station. I mean, if there, one would think that the proximity to the metro station would be the greatest benefit to the to the city in, in terms of a new ability to just reach out and some way or other, attach everything that the city puts there to metro ridership. Whether it's in the form of tourism, you know, big hotel, or whatever, you know, it seems, and this actually puts all the emphasis at the opposite end of the site, away from the metro city. Well, keep in mind, yes, that's true. But the difference in walkability from the football field versus the Haycock is three and a half minutes. So it's not that different. Yes, it's three minutes shorter on the football field versus Haycock, but we don't think that's significant. What is significant is the ability to attract retail developers to this project. Without retail developers, we don't have office. Without office or retail, we have a residential project. I don't think anybody wants that. So unless you're willing to accept a, an exclusively multifamily project, you cannot develop the football field. You cannot get retail developers back in there. Too isolated, too hidden. So you're saying there's no benefit to being so close to the metro mm -hmm. station? Not if no one can see you. No, not if no one can find you. But this there, is, a, there is, is an incredible benefit of mm -hmm. the six minutes, eight minutes. I mean, all of these uses are <coughs> going to be possible, especially especially hotel, residential, retail, office, uh, retail mm -hmm. maybe to a little less extent, and office, because they are quite close to metro. Let, let me give you a, a really good real-world example. Vienna Metro. If you're familiar with the a similar kind of environment. It's isolated. The, the actual land next to the metro station is isolated. They have a town center that's been zoned there for 12 years and residential around it. All the residential is built. The town center has not built one square foot in 12 years, right next to the Vienna Metro. Why? They can't get retailers to go there. Too isolated. They'd rather go to the strip center a half mile away. I would also offer that if the world came together and WMATA and WMATA had a vision to really change what's there at that station in a very significant way, adding a lot of density, not just adding 200 more residential units, but if they really took a clean slate and really changed that whole thing, it might make a difference. But it would take a big critical mass there, I think. Yeah. to make a difference there. Yeah. And we don't see that that's a likely scenario. Even the metro site is not that good for retail. Right. We, we really like leveraging Falls Church's, we like leveraging Falls Church's identity and and allowing this Haycock Road front edge, uh, Broad Street front edge, be the catalyst for other development so that all of those pieces begin to work together as opposed to this sort of isolated jewel, which you know guys like us love drawing, but <laughs> we we think good urbanism happens out at Broad Street. Just one quick follow up: the, the, this hotel is new and has already done surveys of its customers, and the biggest thing these customers say about the advantage of this hotel for them is its proximity to the metro. You know, and this is nowhere near what that could be We're as far as the metro is concerned. So. Why wouldn't a big 30-foot uh, story hotel up there be the best use of that land? We, we provide for I'm telling you the best use. You can believe me or not believe me. Right. But, but also in response to, to your question, one reason for our emphasis on uh, redoing the uh, university leases is we've provided two new streets. We'll have sidewalks. Right now, if you want to walk to the metro station, you have to go out to Haycock. 
uh, there really isn't a pedestrian path. You've got fences with barbed wire on top. And so the first order of business is really to create those connections, which will make it much more accessible and also accessible more quickly. And we feel that it's certainly close enough that people will use the metro station. So it's, again, as Bob said, the three minutes, four minutes doesn't matter. A six easy. minute walk is yeah. very close to metro. Yeah. It's not as good as a three minute walk, but we don't think the difference is significant. Yes. Uh, just a couple of technical questions. Um, uh, on the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, just a um, couple of technical questions on the student housing. I think this is a really interesting idea. I know you guys only had a day and a half to work through this. Um, how, how significant of an educational facility would need to be there to support 500 uh, student residential units? Uh, and then the other technical question I want to throw out there is, um, who does the utilities, the roadways? Is that something that the city ought to think about doing to jumpstart this, or is this something that, you know, it, it comes development yeah, by development? We, we thought through that, and I'll let the experts here. Uh, on the, in, in terms of the first one, I mean, first of all, it's 500 apartment units, some of which we think will be graduate student oriented. We don't think there are, we, and to be honest, we've modeled it as if they are a normal apartment. So to the extent you can keep some of them with no kids at all, no risk of it because of their students, not that some grad students don't have kids also, that's all the better on the numbers. But um, it really does depend on how substantial the campus ends up being and a lot of this is you know it'll be better the more you can get uh, universities active and WMATA active no question everything will be better we have not assumed that in these analysis in this analysis but it would be it would be better and it would certainly generate potentially demand for you know a, a true section of the residential which is totally dedicated to, to grad students in terms of the infrastructure or uh, just to add on the student housing piece Mike the vision that we have is in a student housing building. The vision is a market rate housing with a big block that would be contracted by one of the schools. As, as to your question about the infrastructure, it's a good question. Uh, we did look at that. Uh, the infrastructure could be paid for, could be designed paid for by the city. Um, we assumed, however, that it would be designed and paid for by the master developer, uh, both because of um, you know the master, the capabilities and, and, and consultants and so forth that the master avail master developer would have available uh, at its disposal, but also just from a cost standpoint and a cash flow standpoint, the uh, the city is going to be, you know, taking on quite a bit with the construction of the new school before funds are are coming in from land sales and so forth. So our our expectation is that the city would 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 uh, uh, put that to the developers to provide, but you know there's options. And, and, and by assuming the developer pays for the infrastructure, that of course nets out in your, the city's land is worth less. But that you know, has worth, to come from somewhere. Worth less. Less. Worth less. Worth less. less. <laughs> 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 so, so, uh, just to be clear. Right? It's good. Worth less. Good catch. <laughs> good catch. <laughs> and that was factored in in our, in our analysis of the fund. Yeah. Yes, and uh, in the way back. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the guy. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Brian. Uh, Brian Williams at the EDA. It looks like you have about 6% of the uh, square footage as traditional office, which seems low. Is that based on how much office there is available currently in Tyson's and Arlington, or is that what you think is the best mix here long term? Um, it, it, it's based on the fact that we don't think much of the office market right now, um, and I'll let our office expert. So if you look at all the major lifestyle centers and the type of offices that have been very successful there, they've been very boutique in, in nature. So we, we are saying it's a four story and it is above the podium, so if you're looking at three to four stories of office, you're looking at a certain size and there's been a lot of success in that. And being able to commit early on for a more call it 80,000 square foot office building or so. And frankly, the market's going to tell you. We said this is just our straw man with what conditions are today, but based on the forecast, by the time you're going to market with a master developer five years from now, the market could be booming, Tyson's could be fully leased, and someone could say, hey, I want to convert this into 80% office, which would be great for the city for a lot of reasons. So we're saying let's temper our views, offer a more, more uh, conservative perspective so that we can grapple the challenges and offer some solutions. 
And keep in mind, this is a snapshot, and we had to guess, given today's market, in five years when this happens, the market may change, and as, as Anthony said, it's different. For example, six years ago, we probably would have put three or 400,000 square foot of office here and, and been very happy with that. That isn't, that's not gonna happen in, for a few years, yeah. Wamada would like to talk. Good question. Uh, my question is, what were your assumptions with regard to parking for the various uses, and in particular the retail uses, as the, the restaurants, theater, gym, are, are fantastic candidates for shared parking, and our garage is both virtually empty in the evening, and have you looked at those types of uses and shared uses? Yes. We, we love shared parking. Uh, Peter loves shared parking. Developers love shared parking. Do uh, you want to talk to the ratios that you use to, to run your chart on parking and square footage? Well, we were assuming some shared parking. We didn't have uh, the opportunity to really run it through a spreadsheet methodology. Uh, we, if you use all of the parking ratios that our clients would like to use, we are short of parking on this site. We didn't assume that we could go uh, to, to, the, to the metro uh, uh, garage because we also <coughs> said, well, there may at some point a development may come out that, that needs that parking. So we haven't solved everything. Shared parking should be a part of it. But we're Peter, Peter's. Uh, he, did a, he, he did a great job. We're a little short on parking. I mean, I, parking is always the toughest part, particularly in a dense site like this. The parking is uh, what one level underground and the rest above. But all the above grade parking is laminated in retail, and so you don't see it. Uh, so we've hidden the parking either underground or laminated it, uh, which is what you need to do in these placemaking environments. But we're a little short on parking, and you can solve that by going one more level underground, or by doing shared parking. Or changing the mix. Or mi changing the changing mix, or, ratio. or renting them at night from Wamada. Uh, so we, weren't, we were short on parking, but we didn't think it was a deal killer in any way. Uh, we're comfortable that the parking's good enough. Uh, so, Hi, I would just like to offer an opinion. I, I love the theme of the Agora. Uh, that's the, one of the first things that you guys talked about, and I think it's spot on uh, combining the educational facilities and the commerce. Uh, but I thought, you know, while the school had that theme of the community members going in and using the facilities, the commerce side, that separated block of buildings, I thought was kind of lacking in the ability to continue that theme of education and, and learning. And um, just wanted to offer an opinion that, that while the 3D printing was uh, ruled out for real estate value, something like that kind of facility or a workshop would be really cool here it is competitive in the marketplace in terms of membership fees and material costs uh, for retail. And uh, it could extend the high school uses and the college uses into that commerce landscape. Thank you. I, I, yeah. It's a great point, and I didn't properly finish my thought on the 3D printing. The 3D printing opportunity in terms of light manufacturing use would be an incredible use of the buyer uh, parking lots for the uh, car dealerships right now. And if the buyer family is thinking about going to a more 21st century dealership model where it's just purely showroom and their inventory is somewhere else like Loudoun County, then it is it costs nothing to put up a one-story warehouse building that offers 3D printing, and then you have the right economic basis to provide uh, all that lab space. And it has the potential, when we think of the site that we've chosen on Haycock, to really activate and create the innovative heart for the 21st century Falls Church City. So we totally agree, and we think there's tons of potential that could be explored in, in the upcoming, but. Uh, those low, lower cost uses, which is what you need for an innovative space like that, is what potentially could happen in off-site. Uh, just talking about the Agora concept, uh, let me just explain. <laughs> the Agora calling. Yeah. 
some sheep herders stuck somewhere. Um, here is the here is the the four block uh, ten acre site. Uh, here's the school. Uh, here's the the academic portion. Here's the sort of community common area portion. And we were extremely excited by the fact that over two hundred thousand people a year from the community come to to this community section of the of the high school and use it uh, on weekends and at night. Very, very, it activates this world, and we wanted to make sure that this academic world and community world were could easily access the commerce world. And we did that by making a main street that, that anch was anchored by what we're calling this sort of Agora Plaza, which is would be a very nice plaza. You, you saw those steps, those outside steps that Sean showed you. Uh, it could be featured like that. So that, that there's an easy transition, and it, you're invited to both walk into the school and then walk out of the school into the commerce. That's the kind of Agora concept on, on, on those dimensions. Yes? Let me get some. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> a question for the city people. Um, does, does anyone know what Virginia Tech and, and uh, UVA have planned for their land or their building? Is there any expansion or is there any, anything going to happen there? Isolated building. Okay. Anybody want to answer? <laughs> I tell you, I, I certainly don't want to speak for UVA or Virginia Tech, but I think we heard from their representative yesterday that they do have on the books an additional building or two to come in, but they're really in the process of reevaluating the site. And so I don't think they have definitive plans for the site. And other people were here yesterday, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, my understanding is they're in the process of reevaluating re what they want to do up here in North Virginia. But, but they said it'd be open to the, the parking lot being used. Absolutely. Thanks, Bob. This is probably less of a technical question, a little bit more commentary, and I promise I'll have a question or two in this. Um, I, you know, just a couple of things that, that really struck me with this plan, and there's a lot of things I really, really like about this. Um, the, the road cutting through the site and continuing in the northeast direction across the UVA Virginia parking lot, I think is a game changer. Um, I think it really does help to kind of unify the grid of streets that uh, that you're you're showing in this plan. And the other thing that struck me is reorienting the school um, and having you know kind of the grand entrance. I, I really like that part of the plan. A um, couple of things that I I I wonder if there's opportunities to build on this. Uh, the, the first is overall, the FAR being proposed here in this development program is a 2.6 FAR, I think if I did my math right. We're seeing between two and a half and three OFAR projects in the middle of the city in sites that are not walkable to Metro. And I wonder how much flex there is in this program to get bigger and, and denser and generate additional tax revenue, additional land value given that we're already doing these types of projects in our downtown that you know are at least a mile mile and a half away from metro uh much less a six minute walk the uh the other thing that i, I would love to to hear from the the panel on is are there any ideas that you can throw out there that the city could think about doing whether even it's you know tax abatements tips we talked about a little bit yesterday other tools that we could have in our toolkit to try to attract more office. Because the thing that worries me about this, this type of plan is, um, I think we will probably get some very good high quality development, create a great sense of place. Um, I, I think we should expect probably every developer to come in and propose five stories of residential above one floor of retail. And, and so how do we avoid that? How do we encourage more office to come in this project because even if it's not school kid generating residential it's still taxes our public services our fire safety our parks and open space our libraries there are other costs to residential that office does not bear and and as a city we really suffer from the fact that we have so very little office in here and we, we don't have that good commercial tax base so I, you know i want to throw that out there if there are any ideas i would love to hear them and i think the city could benefit from trying to attract more density and more office into this type of program. Um, I, 
Hey, Bob. I, I don't know how to attract office. <laughs> more, more density is more, about more below grade parking. Mm -hmm. So I, and, I, I think and, that. And above grade structure and higher cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason, uh, I mean, the basic reason is for the, for not going higher is it costs more to go higher because you get out of stick and you go into concrete and steel and the rents both in the apartment and the office don't justify that. So we would have to get more rent to justify going higher. You're right, it's a better site than the others because it's closer to Metro and that should translate to higher rents and it does but they're still not high enough to justify uh, n concrete and steel and going four, four floors below grade. It just, it's not there. It, it might be there in five years when this project is ready to go. I, I think density would, we'd love to put more density on here. Okay. Yeah, I've got a question. I presume that your um, financial analysis dealt with tax revenue generation purely on site. Is that correct? In other words, no spill off generation from neighboring properties. Correct. How can you envision this being catalytic for the parcels next to it? What kind of development might you expect to see as a result of this uh, development as proposed? Anybody want to take that? I can yeah, take that. Yeah, start it. I mean, and you're absolutely right. There are some of those types of indirect impacts that could have a significant additional fiscal benefit, but we'll talk about it from a planning, <laughs> from a real estate perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And just to wrap a little bit on Mike's question on how to attract office, I've been thinking my entire career on how to attract office. And I would say that the opportunity, if you can think bigger with WMATA, with the county, with the buyers, with federal realty, would be the opportunity to figure a, a huge strategic partnership to say, is this something where you can chase biotechnology? Is this something where you could go even bigger? But we're saying, Let's give a base case of 10 acres, and what can we de get done with that base case of 10 acres? And in, in terms of some of the other, other tools in your, your toolkit, uh, Fairfax County, with all the resources that they have around the deployed around the world to try to bring in big office users, are really struggling right now. So this is a universal problem uh, across the board. And Vornado's, Vornado's got some great ideas in Crystal City that, again, if you can partner with the buyers and you can partner with Federal Realty, it, it's a game changer. So I would say, number one, that, that would be how you do that. Um, with regards to uh, catalyzing those other areas, same principle. If you can get the partnership right, which is why I think the team recommended taking a full year or year and a half, we know how anxious you are to get a new school, but if you can take a year, year and a half to get the partnership, and get the buy-in and get everyone uh, pulling in the same direction, it's, it's going to just blow things up. It's going to be amazing what's going to happen uh, in the next 20, 30 years because of that thinking now. Yeah, and all of that does do nothing but add to the fiscal benefits that you're going to get. Um, the other thing which the model doesn't really take into account is all of the Retail and restaurant spending by the by the residents and the residential, and that's you know another advantage to residential, which you know, and when we've done work with other counties, they've and cities, they've taken into into account, and I think makes makes the model conservative, which is good, but I recognize you do get that additional benefit from from the residents, whether they have kids or not. I think we have time for one more question. Just quickly, uh, those two buildings. The two buildings facing um, Haycock Road, um, are they different than the boxes next to them? These two? No, the Haycock Road. Oh, I'm sorry, Haycock. The smaller mm -hmm. rectangles. Yes. What are those about versus the building the office box? Those were the office uses, weren't they? Yeah. One was the hotel, one was the office. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But but uh, I think it's important to note that in Peter's sketch, there was flexibility built in, invariably. What this shows is not what's going to get built, but there's flexibility to change uses. The box, maybe the box may be the same, but the use within may be different. But there's size to be office and hotel at this moment. Yeah. Did you all look at a, a different kind of plan where there's a lot more open space and taller buildings? We I'm can't afford to four city we, on a downtown. We, we can't. The rents here do not justify high-rise construction. We couldn't get a loan on the building, because the rents wouldn't pay for the cost of the building. 
But we're for a high rate. Question if we get six stores now, it's going to get open anyway. So it seems you. like Four Cities is doing very well downtown. Who? They put four, at the, at the yards downtown. They put in the infrastructure. That's a, that's a totally different market. And I, totally I understand different it's a totally different market. I think it's appropriate. But because they put it, in the if infrastructure. It's, if it's and, different, it's not. If I could speak, sir. They put in the infrastructure, and that seems to be drawing now a ton of retail down there. And they have residential coming in. And the scheme has the last pieces are the commercial office spaces that are now part of that. Lots of that, that is a great site. It's not analogous to this site. What is analogous to this site is the Vienna Metro, which is a suburban metro station. It's exactly the same, and there are no re they haven't gotten a retail rent, a retail tenant in 12 years of trying. Or office. Yeah. Or office. The problem is these are ice. These are not. They're good sites, but they're not great sites. We can talk through the office economics in terms of rent. When you talk about a Navy Yards, they're seeking uh, triple net rents of fifty to sixty dollars. Triple net with operating expenses and taxes recovering on top of that would be effectively a, a rental rate sixties up. And when we're talking about Tyson's, Tyson's Tower, which is the best office building in Northern Virginia today is getting rents of $50 a foot all in and they're on top of Tyson's Corner Mall, the world's highest grossing mall. Yeah. So when we think of this site, we think of, okay, what is the market giving us in terms of uh, office rents and best of class buildings? And the Mosaics office building is best in class building, best in class environment, and they're getting a, like a $40 rent all in. So when you think of the economics of that, 40 is often kind of that trigger point to structural, and we already have structural parking, but to do even more, it's just math. And, and when you guys test the market, the math will tell, the, the developers will tell you what is possible. And you could try to push, but it's hard to play against the market. If I, if I could also add to at the yards, there was a $40 million TIF that was issued for that actual place making in that public space. And that, that was the initial investment made by the city prior to the development actually happening. And it was also a, a federal surplus property which had different deals with General Services Administration. So uh, to Bob's point, I think there are a number of different factors here. Okay. With, uh, one more, quick. I just had one. Um, he's not working. I had one question, and it had to do with the time frame for uh, additional impact on the properties to the east and south uh, that are also commercially zoned presently. It has speculation, but you have a feel for what impact this kind of plan might have on those properties over time, or how we might coordinate with those properties. That's a really hard question. I, I mean, it, 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 we're talking about the properties here and here, the Gordon Triangle and the, and the Frit property. I, obviously, if this is done right, uh, it will give th these folks tremendous confidence to invest in their property. And in the buyer's parcel, it will mean that they would go forward with something. In Frit, it might mean that they'll think about Partnering with the city and 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 doing a, a, a forty unit uh, a forty uh, acre project instead of a twenty or thirty acre project, so obviously it'll catalyze it. Putting a timeline on it, I'm I'm not bold enough to do that. Is anybody? Yeah, Len? I mean I'm I'm certainly not bold enough to do all that. But we did learn yesterday something interesting from the federal realty from Evan Goldman at Federal Realty, who owns the Giant Center and CVS Center, that they have quite long leases and parking restrictions and so on on both of those anchors and I think he was sort of salivating about this as the first phase of a redevelopment of this whole area and that as you move forward, and obviously you want this to move forward fast because you need it to pay for the school and to get the school built. That seems to work really, I mean I was thinking he might see this as competitive and he'd rather do his site first. He can't do his site but he's, you know, they are a fabulous developer and they are doing some great projects like Pike and Rose up on Rockville Pike, um, and he really sees this as sort of the first phase of the redevelopment of this whole uh, whole, court, whole uh, area right here. Okay, we better wind this up. Uh, I thank the panel. They were diligent and brilliant. <laughs> and the, staff, the staff who's 
supported us, gave us everything we wanted. And the mayor who was brave enough to bring us in and didn't know what we were going to say, that's, that's impressive. Thank you. And, and to a very engaged audience, uh, it's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you.